I know uh, we don't need an uh, introduction to Professor Anil Gupta, so uh, he's a founder of Honeybee Network. They say, I'm sure they all know. Yeah. So, sorry. So, as part of the student panel, we have uh, Francis from PGP2, Kajori from PGP1, Amit Agarkat from PGP1, and Rajiv Ranjan from FPM, myself, and Kailash from PGP2. So, we'll start with a small introduction about youth policy from Professor. Friends, welcome to this afternoon. I'm very happy that the Public Policy Group of the Institute, which is National Law Group, has organized this debate on a very important subject. It's uh, paradoxical to say that uh, while India is the youngest country, one of the youngest countries in the world, because of the demographic reasons, the engagement with the youth in policy making, in policy take, in policy remodulation is much less than what it should be. So I'm happy that this initiative has been taken where you can contribute directly to the policy making process. However, while going through the comments of the earlier discussion that you've had, I have a few suggestions to make before you start sharing your comments. One is, be as radical as you can. The only reason I'm here, despite my white hairs and white beard, is because I believe that I have not lost my ability to be rebellious. I have not yet lost my ability to say what I believe in. No matter whom it displeases and how much it displeases. So please be as, as irreverent as you can be today. If you feel that what I am saying is nonsense, say that it is nonsense. Also, you don't know anything about what you are thinking about. And we are in a different orbit and you are in a different orbit. You have uh, disconnected yourself from our orbit and say so, whatever you want to say. But it's important that you do not legitimize the tendency of the government to do more of the same. If you read this document, you get an impression that everything that was required to be done has been done, is being done. What is required now is to give it a little more resources, a little more budget. If a tube is punctured and you add more and more pressure or water in it, what will happen? The water will come out with more pressure from more holes, as many holes as they are. But it wouldn't change the direction in water will go. We need to change the direction in which water will go, which essentially means if National Social Services Scheme has lived its activity, you should have the courage of conviction to say, please do not tell us how to be corrupt at a young age. You know, this is what has become. In many places, when you go for an NSS camp, there are all kinds of things that are happening. Neither the inspector is serious, nor the students are serious, Few things are done, if it is for 10 days, you go for 4 days, 5 days, there are funding of 10 days, all kinds of things I've heard about which, which happens. You should have the courage of saying, we don't want to participate in a corrupt process. We don't want to participate in a demoralizing process. We don't need that. I would of course wish that there should be innovation, national innovation service, and I as instead of NSS, but you could have many other organizations. But think of Tunisia, think of Egypt, think of West Asia, think of the revolutions that have taken place in different parts of the world, triggered mainly by the young people. And why would youth of this country be uh, so complacent about the challenges that our society is facing? Two positive things that I think should come out, may come out in today's discussion <coughs> before I hand over to the group. Never before Indians had so much confidence in their liberty as they had today. Today, many of you believe that you can make a difference and you can make a mark globally and that your voice will be heard. That is something very critical. Very critical. Second, there is much greater confidence that you don't have to seek approval from the Western masters, Western bankers to be legitimate in your business. So you don't need necessarily an endorsement from the West for legitimizing your thought. Even though I must admit, because there's one of our FPM friend here in the panel, we still seem to refer much more to the Western scholars than to our own compatriots when we write research papers, we write science. Is that true? We seem to believe that all good ideas must originate at least from West, otherwise they are not good ideas. This mindset at a young age is a pillar of new ideas, is a pillar of new initiatives. So please ask hard questions about the way youth is facing the challenge of the country, and the way this policy is facilitated, 
or thwarting the engagement between youth and the national agenda formulation process. We should not restrict youth to the Department of Youth. The youth policy is not for Department of Youth and Welfare. Youth policy is for engagement of youth with every sector of the economy. So what are the incentives that are available for entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, economic entrepreneurs, education entrepreneurs? What are the barriers to entry in any sector that you wish where you want to enter? What are the youth and regulations? Have they been modified to make the life of startups much more comfortable? To what extent is your wife's heart? How many policies have you sent your feedback on? Ask yourself this question. Many ministries put their policy draft on the website. I would wish that every interest group in the institute and the, this society can facilitate that. If it is a financial policy, policy on financial institutions, on foreign direct investment, or retail, uh, FDI in retail, then the investment group that you have, you have some investment group, isn't it? Should be encouraged to critique that policy and come out with it. So every group of the institute, I would request and appeal to you all, must express its views forthrightly, frankly, courageously, with a word of, with a, with a feeling of conviction on any policy that you have groups for, or any policy that you feel important. You feel important. Even if one of you has a strong view on a policy, even if there is no group on the top subject, have the courage, have the conviction that you will write to the minister concerned. Dear Mr. Jairam Ramesh, I don't agree with what you try to do in this policy. And whatever my ideas are what, I would like to share with you. What worst can happen? You will throw it away. But what good can happen? He might pay attention to it and we call it for discussion. And that's it. So please choose your own pawn, choose your own orbit in which you want to place yourself when the launch vehicle will take you to the orbit. We are a launch vehicle. We do not know in which orbit we should place you. You understand? It is for you to decide now. This institute can only help facilitate and help you to achieve those goals. But we are very keen that the Students Bar Institute must be at the forefront when it comes to policy dialogue, policy making process, policy thinking process in any sector, in any subject. So I'll not say many more words than this. And uh, we'll begin now. You have a better sequence. Please start. Take it. Will you take a mic? And how much time each person is going to take? We will raise the issue and... Uh, Discussion will follow after every presentation or after they all do it? First, I will give a general structure of how this policy is framed and uh, we will raise issues. I mean, let's say education and uh, we will have a discussion on that. Is that the way you want to do so? After each issue, 10 minutes of discussion and then next issue? Yes. Let us do that. So and please, just one second. The ground rule is that don't critique somebody else's idea as your own. Brainstorming becomes most meaningful when we do not comment or critique somebody else's idea. Unless you have a new point, don't say that. So just when somebody makes a proposition, other person critiques it, third person can add a new point. Doesn't matter if it's not linked to the other one. But don't spend too much time discussing only one idea. That's not going to help us. Uh, so in this draft, uh, there was a draft in 2003 which had a different structure. So now they have segmented the youth of India into nine groups. So that's one of the main things. Uh, I mean, uh, main way this draft is structured. So, the uh, nine sections have been uh, given, and uh, uh, in addition to that, they have uh, also segmented youth uh, according to their age. Basically, 15 to 20, 21 to 25, and 26 to 30. So, basically, uh, if you love all these, we get 27 groups. And, uh, well, um, and they also define some. Uh, Priority groups which need immediate attention. Let's say security for women and uh, disabled groups, and uh, 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 youth with social and economic, uh, socially or economically backward uh, youth groups. So those are the groups which need immediate attention. And then uh, there are trust areas, which they have defined. Uh, let's say like uh, education, medical, uh, healthcare, and uh, areas like that where they will. Uh, uh, sought the help of other departments, government departments, to uh, enact the bills to achieve the objectives I mean, that are uh, mentioned in this course. So, okay, so uh, this uh, just a short summary of how it's planned to be implemented. 
this is just uh, the national policy, just the direction for the policy to be implemented. So the actual policy implementation will hap happen through uh, state level youth development agencies. So uh, the state has to pass legislation and they have to implement this minimal set of policies that this policy has given. And beyond that, they can have additional programs also through the youth development agencies. And for this, they are planning to have a they're, they're suggesting that each state have a state coordinating committee which is chaired by the chief minister or, uh, or a minister or any senior member of the cabinet. So apart from this, they also want to have a coordination committee at national level because this involves uh, various ministries to be uh, in coordinating. So for example, HRD, Rural Development, Women Welfare, Health Ministries, and all these to be uh, involved in this. So they want a national level coordination committee also. So how they are going to monitor this is using the Youth Development Index, which is somewhat similar to the Human Development Index. This Youth Development Index has five domains. They measure development of youth in five domains, that is health, education, employment, amenities, and participation. Uh, so this is about the short summary of the bill. <coughs> going forward to the uh, issues that the panel found in the bill, the first one was uh, we found that uh, the target groups have been identified correctly and given precisely to uh, precisely to the extent of uh, good detail. Like they have student youth, rural youth, tribal youth, and youth with social and moral stigma. But the problem is that the target groups identified are just identified uh, and they have they are not they are not been acted upon. So then the next part of the bill we have the thrust areas that you are again. Uh, uh, taking the uh, and putting the responsibility on separate ministries for uh, providing education, health, and sectors like that. So there is no correlation between uh, the thrust areas and the uh, target groups. So there, are, I think uh, we feel that the, each target group will have uh, specific needs under each of these domains, like education. Education for student youth and urban youth will be completely different. So that. Uh, alignment is not there. Uh, what we felt was uh, basically there are 27 groups that have been identified. So when they talk about uh, healthcare needs for the 27 groups, they have not actually uh, met the needs of each of the groups. They have just uh, they just talk about healthcare and put in, uh, uh, I mean, just uh, healthcare should be good for youth and all that. I mean, it's very generic. So the point of actually segmenting the uh, youth into 27 groups has been lost. I mean, it's been the the purpose of segmenting the group is lost in the thrust areas where policy intervention is needed. So that's one of the main problems we found the structure of the policy. If it had been uh, like a matrix of say 27 across the number of thrust areas, it would have been easier for the public to actually scrutinize the policy and uh, come up with solutions. So that's that's a suggestion on the policy of sorry, uh, the structure of the draft. Anyone has any, any comment on yes? Please. Yeah. So one of the major things uh, that differentiates youth between the rest of the country is, I mean, that is why you need a youth policy, something which is not generic, like health. Health is not just required for youth; it is required for everybody else also. What we are here, we should focus on things which are which can be only for youth. Just like like some somebody mentioned that uh, they are, they are identifying the people who are uh, from discriminated class and structure. So one of the major first areas which I think is missing here is uh, the fact that this is the age group where you can change the mind. This is the age group where you can trust yourself so that you can uh, reduce the caste distinctions in our, in our society. Now, once a person reaches maturity, it's very difficult to change his ideas. But that is the time when you have to uh, well, you have to get rid of superstition and get rid of all the caste structures that you have. That should be one of the major things. Which I find I agree. That's a very good point. Very good. Any other comment? On where are we missing in the pitching of the policy? The general point about that there is a segmentation of various classes of views, but the policy doesn't target these segments. Should it target these segments? Or should it try to leverage every policy from the youth perspective? They are two different viewpoints. The one thing which I am looking at the, uh, the draft is, again, if uh, the ministry or the ministers, for example, the implementation part, state coordinating committee are chaired by the chief minister and again different ministries. 
So again, there is a kind of a presumption among the ministries or the government that it is the custodian of those people, again, those not the part of you. So they define the uh, whatever the committees and all. Because they think that you know we are the custodians of this and we know what should be the next direction. That's one thing. The second thing that I observed is uh, there are already established institutions which are done by the government. It looks like another template of doing the same kind of policy where they again propose something and again they go back, connect to the established institutions. I don't think we, the existing the existing institutions like they mentioned about uh, uh, NSTC. Okay, it can help us, but I think we should look for some more innovative institutions which can support the bill, the true spirit of the bill. Anybody else? Yes. The target groups that have been specified, they are mutually exclusive. So, even other student who is also in risk, who is in risk of violence. So, the uh, problem of having such groups is it might happen that a student goes and the thing that he requires falls under some other trust group. And so then there is a passing of the accountability that no, this is for this group. So I think there is a problem there that uh, the way the group has been might, uh, could have been improved. Because a student can well be from a backward, uh, so why the group and students and backwards. But the grouping, I think, could have been more innovative. This is a good point. Would anybody like to mention that what are the what are the characteristics or attributes of a youth as, youthful aspiration which are missing from the document completely? Completely missing. Exactly. I was just thinking that uh, the first word that comes to my mind is innovation. Because when I think of aspirations, and uh, with the changing times, we are looking at aspirations not only in terms of access to facilities, but also there is extreme recruitable uh, distribution of resources in a society. There is a lot of agitation about the youth regarding that. So the bill completely misses on equitable distribution of resources. Yeah, I mean, if you are not rebellious, uh, Minu Masani said that if you are not a socialist before 25, and a capitalist after 25, <laughs> then there is something wrong with your uh, youthfulness. So I think uh, you are very right that equitability as an attribute of a society. If it doesn't occur to us an important person at this young age, then when would it occur? So, but you this. I think on this point, if we can spend one or two minutes more as to which aspirations of you, one is about equitability of resource allocation, what else, which other aspirations of you are missing completely from the world. So we will come to tinkering later on, but let us look at the complete absence of certain perspectives from this policy. Yes. Where are the species called youth found? Youth? that generic uh, youth that we are referring to, what is it and where is it found? Geographically, where? No, 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 not geographically, it is the age group that we are taking. I and you may not agree with that view. <laughs> where is it found? <laughs> that apart, we but believe youthfulness is a state of mind and a heart rather than than physical age, but, but for the purpose of today, they are defining it as the age group. That apart, what I am trying to indicate, it is geographically inhabiting some space. When you want to interact or lay down a policy or an enabling framework, then you got to come down to that place where it spends most of the time. Yes. So in case you got to start it off, you got to start assembling them by their respective localities which they spend most of the time. And it is not vis-a-vis -vis education, vis-a-vis -vis religion, caste, creed, ability, etc. Because that is the space where they interact and they interact across all the categories which have been given out here. But you have a point, I mean, if you extend this point further, then if you look at migration, then youth are the most migrant population. And if migration, in the growth rate of metropolitan is about 8%, bigger city is about 4 to 6%, average city is about 3 to 4%. So in other words, cities are growing at a much faster pace than the population of our country. And surely, these numbers are increasing because there are young people are migrating. So this is a good point, someone that you say that if a lot of young people are gravitating towards certain clusters, certain geographical centers, then uh, shouldn't that also be looked at as to what facility, how many youth hostels, for example, do we have in this country? How many youth hostels? You know, in any European society you go, you have those youth hostels, cost $15 a day maximum, you can stay there, come out in the morning, 
go do whatever you want to do, come back and sleep there neatly, nicely, comfortably, very functional, very, very secure, very safe. Now, why don't we have large number of youth hostels when we know that migrant youth will not have the ability to hire a house or rent a house to begin with in their career. They will need some places, not Grand Basera, which are for the people who are on the street, but something between Grand Basera and a, and, and a rented house, you know? Something in between that. So you don't have that. I was talking about the natural right grouping. Target. The natural grouping, the way it exists. If you go to a market, you will find a lot of labor out there. They have a natural group out there. If you come to a mohalla, a colony, or an area, or an educational institute, you will find a natural group out there. Now, this particular group has a collective aspiration beyond the individual aspiration. And this is precisely where the policy intervention can be targeted to have a measurable result over time. Yeah, so it's a good point. So you mentioned about aspirations which are individual aspirations. To some extent, what he's adding now is collective aspirations. Let us go to the next point. Uh, so one more thing that uh, the youth policy has done is basically uh, to compare it with the, to the last policy. The age group was between 13 to uh, 35. Uh, they were considered as youth. Now for this policy specifically, uh, they have reduced it from uh, 16 to 30. So what about the age of 13 to 15? That is a very critical and a crucial age where uh, the minds are developed and the person's uh, attitude or I mean, it's basically a foundation stage for a person. So how this that going to get handled or uh, is it being accounted? I thought you would say that people become younger at a younger age now. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, it should have been reduced further. It should have been, ten, you know, the two kids have set up a company recently, you must have read about 10 years and 12 years. Correct? Now, they are young people. They are not kids. They are young people. So, if anything, the policy should have started now from 10 years, maybe. Or, you know, because our kids are setting up enterprises. At that age, why, what a wonderful thing to see in our country. So you're right, you're absolutely right. That point, I think we should not argue. We, are, we should just endorse it. That the logic demand that when the responsiveness of the kids is increasing because of the exposure to the media and you know, all kinds of things that they're doing in their life, uh, they're having in their life, it's all the more necessary that we should start treating them as responsible youth at an earlier age than at a later age. So, uh, again, the so, thing is, if uh, I mean, RT might, might uh, account for education of these age groups, but there are other factors also that we need to take into consideration, like I mean, they have they talked about health and other social stigma and other things. So those things need, also need to be addressed for the lower age groups, so which I think is missing to a certain extent. You are right, if you look at the crime in the schools, I mean, the crime by the young kids in the school, there's things which you thought would be done by the young people are done by the kids now. So in every respect, violation of the law, or positive spirit of entrepreneurialness is the spirit they are doing something always uh, younger than before. Positive and negative both. Okay, anything else? Next group? Next, next, next intervention. So, uh, one of the main thrust areas that they have identified is uh, employment and entrepreneurship. So, uh, employment, skill development and entrepreneurship. So, the uh, the first thing in that is the skill development. So the policy just notes that uh, the Prime Minister's National Skill Development Corporation is uh, is already working on it. So they are planning for a huge increase in skill labor by 2015. Uh, I'm not I'm not sure uh, there is contradiction in the numbers given by the government. Some uh, some say it's, they want to increase skill labor by 500 million. And it's some other, it's a conservative estimate of one to three million. But again, here uh, the the policy doesn't specifically say uh, any give any suggestion for NSDAC. Uh, but uh, the industry has already given its kind of feedback on NSDAC, and they have found out that uh, this is uh, this is more played more like a political number game. So they are just putting a number called one to two, one to three million. But it is not directly. The skill development is not directly correlated with the uh, industry, and so industry, uh, so they, the industry thinks that it has to be reverse work from from the industry demand. Then you have to figure out how, what, in what ways the skill has to be developed, and then NSGAC has to uh, uh, formulate this sector skill councils that which they have done now. So that is one of the main uh, criticisms that we have. Should the skill development be a part of youth policy at all? When we are talking about youth, what are we talking about? Are we talking of identity? Are we talking of 
collective aspirations? Are we talking of the group per se as it exists in the natural surrounding? Or are we talking about empowerment in terms of skills, in terms of education, in terms of better employment opportunities? This is not actually employment exchange type of a thing that we are discussing. To my mind, it is more of a social uh, movement that we are discussing when we are talking of youth policy for a nation. What is no, I, 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 I think uh, the point here is, uh, and the, again the target groups come into the picture here, so not all groups of youth targeted or uh, their aspirations are already crossed to the level where they want more opportunities, more freedom. So still there are part of youth who are economically marginalized who still need to get so some help. My, my suggestion is that uh, there is an encounter approach to policy mm -hmm. Encounter. So, for example, if you go to the NSCC website and uh, send a mail or call up a chief and then that. And then look, I want to organize this phase of this kind in my community, in this place where I come from. And for how long do you think it would take for me to get going? And what are the information that you need? And my qualification is that I'm just a final year student, PhD student, and I don't, I can't, and I have no collective to offer, and I have no other credential except my commitment to do this. Have I any chance? And for all that you know, you will discover how that policy ends up you. Now, unless you do that, and in writing, and, and in a specific way of encountering the system, you will not discover its properties. You know, Kurt Levin and Marx both are credited with the statement that we want to understand something, try to change it. Now, try to tweak that system and tell them, that, look, why can't I am willing to submit you a business plan of what any skill building project that I want to run for maybe 50,000 kids or young people in my community or whatever, in this time frame, this is a business plan. Please run it. Rather than telling me 100 reasons why it cannot be done. So, the way the skill development cooperation is working today is very, very unsatisfactory. This is not geared to deliver results. So, my feeling is that before 31st, if some of you can take time to confront each of the institutions, Nari Yuga Kendra, any, anybody of you has been part of Nari Yuga Kendra, those who come from rural areas? And what is their experience? So what I'm saying is those who have first-hand knowledge, put it on a piece of paper. I'm not saying you can generalize only your experience. Call up 10 other Jigo Kendras in your neighborhood. Just call up by taking the phone number that are available on the net. Just call up 10 other people, 10 other numbers. Find out what are the activities they have done, how many people they have got trained or whatever else that they have done. Find out. In other words, a lot of things that are happening here for the last 50 years, 40 years, some are 30 years, have rusted, have not served their purpose, they don't engage the most creative and brilliant mind of our society, they don't challenge, they have nothing to do, they have nothing to show in terms of their achievements or impact, and yet the policy says they will continue. Now how can it continue? So try to ask for low transaction cost and transaction cost counters for delivery and implementation of policy. Yes, one of the chief areas that has been identified here is education. Right. So, like, if I if I like to combine both the things, like unemployment and education, so it's often seen that in a school of like 200 children, there's just one teacher who's teaching there, and again, we have so many qualified youth who do not get a job. So, like, uh, I have seen this kind of a thing being implemented in my state. Like, you have a state level exam. And according to the classes from which you want to sit, like I want to be a teacher of class 4 to 7 maybe. So I, accordingly, the syllabus is divided. I give the exam. If I get a minimum score, I just need to go and show that I have got this score and this is my qualification and I get the job. So doesn't this policy also facilitate that if such a thing is happening in one state, maybe such good things can be taken up and implemented on a national level. So it might, you know, to some extent, it will solve the problem of teacher shortage and there's so many youth who need a job and don't get it. So it also paves the way for them to get, you know, things that they deserve. So I think that is one good point of this policy that maybe something which is happening in a state no longer remains confined to that state only. If it's a good thing, it can be implemented on a national level also. Did you find that scope here? So like, they are talking about working in coordination with the states. That doesn't mean what you said. What you said just now is a very good idea that whatever systems are working, wherever they are working, should be replicated in a time-bound manner. 
Polarization is a very loose word which can mean anything and anything. So what you're saying is more precise than what the document says. And also, I mean, uh, the system of employing, I mean, getting features, uh, not with a conventional method of qualifications and, uh, I mean, experience and all that. They have this uh, simple exam which uh, actually just decides the qualification required for that particular job. Not that a generic qualification, I mean, a plus two pass is a generic qualification which has a lot of other things also. But for teaching students, there are certain things required which this exam takes care of. So basically, uh, that reduces the transaction, I mean, uh, that makes the process easy for uh, getting jobs for the existing ones. So that's Anybody else? Uh, you want to add to this? No, it's uh, so, uh, carrying on what you said, both of you said, uh, I come from a family where my mother is a teacher in a B.A. college. So, I have experiences firsthand. Many of the people who go into the field of education, it's supposed to be a very noble field, but they go into that field as a second choice. Or the first, first whatever. Yeah, like, so the idea is at the government level we have like honestly failed to engage good people into that profession. Very true. Very On good. the other hand, uh, like uh, initiative like Teach for India. Now it's a very very good private initiative. It is not only engaging people because like you said, we do not just need a qualifying exam. What we need is people who want to take that thing forward and teach. So I think if we can replicate something like that in your policy field, it would be much more useful. Okay. What he is talking about is providing better incentives for people, that means for fields in which youth are not getting directed, like you can talk of education, teaching, then you can talk of politics, and uh, so those areas should be more uh, incentive oriented, so that has not been emphasized in this policy, so that should be one point that should be included, okay. because there has been some uh, faint mentions of the these things, but it has not been clearly defined. Incentive for attracting talented youth. Yeah, in different, different uh, marginal or different sectors. Different okay. sectors. There is a need. Yeah. So I, would okay. like to, I would like to extend this point, like attracting the youth, because every year, like hundreds of who are directed, who have a direction, leave the country. Like, there's a brain drain. Because I, I personally know, like many of my friends have left the country. They have a huge talent, science talent. They have left the country, they will do pursue their research, their PhD in, in USA. Not just because they want to do research, they, can, they could have done that research in India also. They could have contributed to science here itself. We could have done great things. But they do it in US and Europe because they have great incentives to do. So government should think of something like that, that they create certain incentives so that those talent do not go outside the country. And they are retained and so we can prosper. Like, other countries very fast. Okay, okay. Anybody else? Before you have another 15 now. Time uh, we are 4:35, so we have another half an hour. The policy yes. also creating knowledge networks. Uh, I mean, uh, which talks about just creating uh, links between existing organizations. And uh, it was, it was. Now, can we, can we, we, we discuss the skill? We didn't discuss entrepreneurship much. Ah, yes. Are there? Yes. You coming to that? Yeah. Okay. This knowledge network is aimed to. Promote entrepreneurship among the youth. So that, I mean, the trust, uh, that, that's what this uh, creating knowledge network is all about. And uh, in that, the uh, basic thing is they, uh, you know, it's a very positive move that they are actually uh, trying to create a knowledge network which increases the success rate of all the entrepreneurs, I mean, any entrepreneurial uh, venture. But uh, uh, to promote entrepreneurship, there are other uh, needs that are. Uh, I mean, the other needs that has to be satisfied, which are uh, the finance, I mean, with uh, the, the financial, uh, the venture fund or, or loan that needs to be, uh, uh, now it's very costly for an, very costly or the process is very uh, difficult for the entrepreneur to get a loan or a venture, I mean, the seed fund for uh, starting a venture. So that, that barrier has to be removed or uh, uh, an organization which comes forward to remove, the, uh, remove that barrier has to be incentivized. That's what uh, we feel. And uh, uh, also, any entrepreneurial venture needs an incubation center for uh, developing itself. So that also does not find any mention in this policy. So uh, about this, uh, we need a comments on 
Okay, come up with some radical, radical, creative, innovative suggestions. Yes. One thing. Uh, I have first-hand experience of a very rural area uh, near my hometown. So there are people who have very good traditional knowledge of plants, of medicinal plants. And uh, it's like there are bioindicators. Just looking at the uh, particular plants, they can predict that next weather is going to be like this. Or this particular crop will be good for next one. And then what's happening right now is many people are migrating from that particular area too. And then this knowledge is not being documented at all. So what I feel is maybe in next 10, 15 years, we'll be having very handful number of people who will be left out with this precious knowledge, with this traditional knowledge. So why can't something be done on like documenting the knowledge, what we already have, rather than uh, like incentivizing for other things. First, what we already have at rural level, let's document it, let's work on it so that uh, that can be very true. Very true. I'll come to that because there's some dialogue which is going on, but not yet successful. Anybody else on this issue? Yes. Uh, I just wanted to bring one point that the social uh, attitude towards entrepreneurs should change because means people in India think like uh, doing a startup when you start a company it is quite difficult. So people think you take a good job. That means that attitude should, should change because you should think about the long term vision. Means there is a risk, a lot of risk involved, but that risk is there. But then you have to uh, uh, take those risks to reach those points. So that uh, anti social attitude should be changed. Yeah. I would like to add this point. Yeah. Like what I may ask, like uh, two years of placement holiday. So during this period, we can take up any entrepreneurial venture, uh, opt out of placements, and take up our own venture. Uh, this mitigates our risk, right? So this policy can be followed by all undergraduate uh, colleges also. It is not being that. I don't of any issue that is following this kind of practice. So could be encouraged. Yeah. Somewhat different point, but uh, I was just uh, reading through. So uh, according to me, our education system needs to change slightly more, slightly, so that we, we encourage people to go out uh, and have start a venture, start a business. Uh, in throughout our curriculum, till class 12, you don't know even know how to do get basic things done to how to file an FIR, how to get a loan from a bank, stuff like this, stuff which are practical, which you will uh, encounter every day. This is something which is not never taught, and this is something which should change. This is what will uh, change the minds of people, so, so that they don't have to make mistakes and learn. These things are taught. Also, when we talk about uh, increasing the scope of education, we generally talk only about increasing the, you know, imparting necessary skills. In this case, I generally at a lower level. But if we could link that, you know, link important entrepreneurial skills with education in two ways. One, uh, you know, making the uh, availability of funds linked to your education. You know, like microfinance institutions giving out uh, loans to people who are fifth grade pass so, And then also this fifth grade need not mean that you have, you have read geography and history, which is not at all relevant to your daily employment. But this fifth grade means you have a necessary skill in not just you have learned carpentry or for a, for a plumbing or anything, but you have a skill in you know identifying the market or maybe you know so you give out uh, teach them how to touch their own uh, juice machines or teach them how to uh, make you know, pull their own shots or something in any way. So two ways: uh, one is impart necessary skills, and second thing is make the availability of funds linked to this, so that more people they come in for a formal skill-based enhancement education. Okay. Uh, I think I'm waiting for some really concrete, practical instruments through which government could treat the policy for increasing entrepreneurial opportunities for youth. Please focus on that. We want some really practical, concrete suggestions which can increase entrepreneurial opportunities for youth in rural, urban, northeast, south, urban. Yeah, so I, I have a solution. Yeah, please. Yes. Let's yes. So, for uh, going for a long term, uh, you need to be risk proof. So, the government needs to have measures uh, so that uh, people who, who want to go for entrepreneurship are given certain social measures so that they can be uh, secured about their family. Social measures meaning? Uh, they, uh, uh, if, if, you are going, uh, if you are going for an entrepreneurship, maybe the government can have some, some kind of an alarm, an alarm which, uh, which can be given to people who want to go into the social sector and do some social entrepreneurship. 
so that their basic needs are at least fulfilled. Even if you look into the need theories, a person will only go to a level of self-actualization, creativity, freedom, when his basic and security needs are fulfilled. You think so? That, that is not the case. You think so? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll leave it at that, yes. So, so, yeah, just let us, let us hear. Yes. So, you know, I've been listening to uh, your, your comments with a lot of interest. And uh, so, one point that I wanted to mention, and this is uh, very much uh, linked to a very interesting uh, happening of, about 100 years ago when Andrew Carnegie, you know, the uh, Bill Gates of his time, endowed 2,500 public libraries in the United States. So, his entire fortune was given for that. Now, libraries are something that we in India have neglected, public libraries in particular. Because libraries are not just repositories of learning, they are also community centers. And this is also something that I have seen around the world. That many of the things that you're talking about, you know, let us promote entrepreneurship, let us promote awareness about X, Y, or Z, all of these can have a home and a very interesting environment if one builds even small public libraries, right? With 2,000, 3,000 well chosen books a couple of NGOs who sort of take care uh, of that library, and a couple of NGOs who basically use it as a social organizing center. So it provides the right ambience, and you can even have some kits. You know, I know, uh, uh, I know you've worked with uh, many entrepreneurs who've developed those. We put 10 or 12 kits about popularizing science, right? You learn science by doing it. So essentially, if you can revitalize some small libraries, and basically come up with a proposal which says, look, we will empower every community of 50,000 or 25,000 to have a small one-room library and a science center and a community center which will bring in entrepreneurship, which will bring in all of these things. I think that can be a very powerful way of involving the government of the community. I just want to add some more. Uh, shall we hear yeah. that? Yes, yeah, come on. Mm -hmm. I just want to, like, I have seen such a thing happening in my college. So one of my friends, as a part of the course study, he developed a uh, handwritten Agarbatti maker. So, you know, it was just a part of a small, uh, like, in-course thing. And he went on to win an award in uh, one of the competitions, which were, uh, I think, sir, you were also friendly there. So now currently he is working with an NGO to you know bring out a more viable option, like you know how can these be made more cost effective. So I feel that if he had not taken part in the competition, maybe his idea would have to remain confined to only my college or the small community there. So I believe that if such kind of competitions are held more often, it adds more credential to what you are doing. So if he now goes, he can say that I have won this award, so and people do take it seriously. So I think that that is one way, you know, in which you can promote entrepreneurship by organizing such kind of events so that it also helps whoever is, you know, the best five ideas, they are, you know, they get, yes, uh, you have won an award, so it adds value to it. So I think that is one. Yeah, I have a first hand information about starting the library. Uh, we started at club, youth club, and we started at celebration library. So, uh, Mr. Nataka, they scored to work. So in that what happened, we started a library and uh, we had additional two books. Basically we went each home of a professor, teachers and some leaders and we collected the books, which they used but they are not reading now. We started a library. So to encourage people participation among the youth basically, we said every month whatever you read, you will have a kind of a club. I mean, uh, we call it as a monthly read. So you have to come and express what you are done. But when we see after a few years or one, two years, when we were there actively and people are coming, I mean the students were coming. But after two or three years, four years, the student participation has come down significantly. So when we try to know why the students are not coming forward, it is because that the kind of work they are getting in the school and colleges, they are not allowing them to come and participate in any kind of community participation or get together. So, and slowly the reading interest among the kids or among the students, even among the youth, has come down drastically. So, I, we have a capacity to start up a library. Now, literally all my books have been closed down and I don't know how to keep them now. So, this is one reason. Even I, I again, because I cannot lead the same library for a long time. I even motivated one or two people who are junior to me. They they were not that competent or that not interested, you know, to run, run the library. 
we did a lot of things so that I can motivate the next generation of leaders. I mean, basically, to transfer that responsibility to carry forward. Because I'm getting older, I cannot do with those kinds of things. But I could not. I, I, no, I mean, making I mean, <laughs> Since I'm more into the, some other kinds of responsibility that I cannot handle. So, but now, literally, all my books which I collected from the Infosys Foundation and all, they are not being read. I think that is consolidated at this point before we go further. Five, six issues have come up. One was about mapping the knowledge, a very critical, very important point because never before in the history of humanity, not just India, humanity, so much knowledge was lost in such a good time. The connection between grandparents and grandchildren is the weakest in our generation. Never it was so much. Which means the loss of erosion of knowledge is the rampant, fastest, steepest. So this is a very important issue, an urgent issue. After 10 years, there will not be much left to record. Anyway. So one suggestion was that you have this 250 million people being given 100 days of employment under the MNRGA. And the idea was that five days out of 100 should be spent for knowledge mapping, resource mapping. Just what are the different resources, what are the different plants, what are the different soils. Just map, and when you map resource, you map knowledge. Because resource without a uh, key, without the interpretation, will not be resource. So this has been going on from Dr. Kalam's time. After that, one president has gone, and another president has come. We will pursue this issue, but this must come up in your recommendation, because I think it's a very powerful one. Second is that if those of you who have interest in finance can construct the essential of a fund, which can be created even by the individual donors. But at district level, let us say, with certain provision that it must provide avenues in open access, anybody should be able to apply, it should be inclusive, etc. Et it cannot be for a particular community, particular region, or particular uh, uh, cultural group. What incentive needs to be given for high net worth individuals to create a startup support funds? Not for corporations. That doesn't work, it doesn't work, let us not forget about it. But high net worth individuals who would like to contribute 5 lakh, 10 lakh, 1 lakh, whatever amount, can that fund be created at district level? A district social venture fund or district venture fund, something of that kind. Every district should have a fund of. And these funds can have such funds. Somebody can say, I will only invest in services, I will only invest in education, I will only invest in, let us say, food processing. Fair enough. That much of restriction one can have. But what kind of incentives we can give? Today, only ATG is available for NGOs. Why can't these funds become eligible? Not ATG, I would say 35 CC for that matter. And the government, watch how should these funds be governed so that they are transparent, so that they have served the purpose. And you can withdraw the sanctions if you wish after two years, three years, if they are not serving the purpose for which they are intended. So there should be a sunset clause. It is not that you should you will get it forever. So try to create an instrument which is decentralized, is, is, can be managed, by people at the district level, through market committees or whatever, traders, whosoever want to do it, for the youth of that region. That would be another instrument that we can see. Because many of you have mentioned about the lack of startup capital, which is very true. We don't have any angel funding in this country, what the name. And it will be very useful if we can start in a decentralized manner rather than only centralized manner. Third thing, that competition point she mentioned is a very good one. That more competitions you have decentralized, more talent will come up. We only have music competition, we have this dance competition, I and mean, these are the things that media is occupied with. I and mean, there are a lot of other type, kind of talent. So why can't we promote avenues for such talent to be identified? Uh, you will be glad to know that um, tomorrow there is a meeting, 2,000 scholarships will be given to children for talent. Now talent other than science and technology. So if you are a very good photographer, and if people like Ravrai evaluate your photograph to be wonderful, you get Fifty thousand rupees a year for next till the education complete and in school, so that you can aspire to be a photographer. Doesn't matter what you do the rest of your life. So we are trying to give this tomorrow. There will be a final shape to this policy. Uh, it is uh, something that is uh, very very fortuitous for our country. But we never had a talent promotion effort of this kind. We only got science, technology, math, which we need, but we also need this. So think of other ways of competition. Are one way, but what are the other ways of identifying talent? and nurturing them, even if they fail in math or science or English, can they have a future as a talented person in some field of activity? That was a good point we should come to. Library is extremely important. I think we must include that not only, as I rightly said, not just for reading, but as a cultural center. In Gondal, 
Maharaj Bhagwan Singh Ji, he was the one hundred years ago, 1896-98, every village had a library. You know, the most literate women were found in Golden State. So there, the women had the highest esteem, and people wanted to get girls from that community, that, that region, for marrying. So they were in highest demand. So if you look at the marriage market at that time, women of Golden had between them. Because they were all educated. So only time, only place you will find grand, educated grandmothers will be from that region. Most of the time, in the rural areas. That made the difference. But that was the place which had the first telephone line, first railway, you know, all, going, all kinds of infrastructure that, that it was a very advanced, very, very progressive. So it is, it is something which has happened in our country. We must do it. And this policy should be strongly refunded by you that we should think of libraries with cultural centers and close down all in every European country. So you should also say, I mean, you can't add without subtraction. So when you add this, subtract something. Say that every book that should be closed down, and you should have some new Vekaran cultural center, or library, or whatever. It's there, 150 there of Vekaran. Why can't they have Vekaran centers in every village, every district? So that would be very good point. Next issue, now. anything else? You have not spoken up. Are there any other issues that have come up? No. We have little time. We have only 15 minutes. Well, so we uh, speak about education now, and uh, the policy speaks about uniformity in education. Uh, so, in property speaks about uniformity, it's not being segregated to speak about infrastructure or address the resources which are required for education. And it, as you've mentioned, it doesn't talk about the alternate careers. It's mainly in India, it's been focused on uh, science, technology, and medical, it, it needs to focus more on other alternate uh, careers options which are available for the youth and which it does not address right now in education. Right. Right. So, that's one thing. Oh, yes. Multiplicity of agencies, this policy, it impinges on most of the government different departments, etc. Moment you have multiplicity, you have confusion, there will be no single ownership. And for whatever thing that is, there is no single ownership, it won't come. The so you have to chop it down to come down to exclusive, so that you can pinpoint responsibility. The vicarious way in which this works very well is, if you are excluded from one, you are not excluded from all. But if there is only single, once you are excluded, you are excluded from all. So therefore, there is a risk in monopolizing too much of power in one hand, even in terms of opportunities. So probably multiplicity is not too all bad in a democratic society. Sometimes it works. So people can be excluded not from all. At least for some, they may get a chance. Yes. I have a little different point to make. Uh, until now, most of the discussion was focused around students and uh, through uh, about education. Uh, but see, uh, most of the groups are of the disadvantaged ones, like uh, the deprived ones, the tribal ones, and such like These people are, uh, though the education will empower them, but uh, they have a mindset, uh, the society creates the mindset about them. When they see someone who is disabled, uh, they create a uh, sympathy towards them rather than they appreciating the talents of that person. So that's all uh, an inclination of the policy to, towards providing uh, that mindset uh, changing. Like, uh, I, I can quote an example of miracle couriers. Uh, they, yeah, uh, came up in the, uh, yeah, they, uh, they have employed, they have a very good policy of uh, using only hearing with the person to push uh, their careers. And uh, like that kind of entrepreneurship opportunities, and which change mindset of people, like Pita Hart also employed that, uh, and Domino's employ that uh, able person. So it, it's in change of the mindset of the people, and that is one of, one of the very important factor to uh, make the all the groups inclusive to the society and uh, make them empowered. So that's my point. Um, actually, say you mentioned about collecting, uh, making some form of investment from people which have high net worth. I think for skill development also, like there is a very big requirement for funding for skill development. People are not moving out of their traditional work, like rickshaw pullers. They know that it's not good for health. Most of them don't survive beyond 40. And it's because of the inertia to get out I and mean, to attain skill or to make an investment. So uh, in skill development also we can form some kind of an institutional setup where private parties can invest 
and the part of the earnings, I mean, maybe for a span of two or five years, can be given back to them as a return to their investment or some policy in similar terms and some tax benefit, then maybe people will come forward. Something like a... Well, there is a policy of NSDC is that, that you have a private sector partner and public matches the contribution, but unfortunately it's not working very well, but there is a policy for that. Which at the state level, we are setting up central excellence for skill development and some government activities, but it's not working very well. Anybody else? For uh, one thing which has been missing, and we are coming to 5 o'clock, so we don't have too much time in 15 minutes. What will youth do? I'm only hearing about what should be done for the youth. But there's nothing coming out as to what will youth do for the nation. Can we do nothing? I mean, just to give an example, and this is my favorite example, I'm biased in favor of this, so don't mind it. I will not tired of I'm never going to get tired of repeating this example because it's very close to my heart. If each one of you made one lesson or one class or one subject, there are 800 students on our campus plus PTAs and others. You will get 800 beautiful lessons. Any subject, any class, any language. What an interesting lesson. It could be on gravitation, it could be on evaporation, it could be on surface tension, it could be on any subject of science, math, in the language in which Open source content, for which we need no incentive from the government. It's in our hands. And I can get it delivered to all the 150,000, 650,000 villages, 150,000 post offices, one post office, one CD, we go to the four villages. All the 650,000 villages can be covered in one month. Entire country can be beamed the content that you will produce in one month. Clear. Without any ambiguity. Without any doubt. What about the content? For the children. For your own younger brothers and sisters, recent nephews, friends and others, you know? Do you think it is possible? Can you make a commitment in the policy? That youth of IMA is going to contribute 800 lessons. <laughs> I mean, let us put up, I mean, what is the point of giving comments and telling government what they should be doing without saying anything what we will do? I mean, what is the credibility we have for influencing policy if you don't make any commitment of what you will do? I mean, even if you mentor one kid in a rural institution, rural school, that itself is a great contribution, no? 800 kids can be mentored who do not have access to the institution by powers, but, and they don't, don't even know what they should choose. A lot of young people in rural areas don't know what they can do, no matter how talented they are. Yes. Yeah, please. Sir, just add to your point, actually. So, uh, the, uh, I know my friend Zantar, who is uh, the, the CTO of Google Asia Pacific, he quit to start exactly that initiative which is speaking about. It's called Guru. It's an e-learning, open source uh, learning content in which students can actually develop class lessons and actually put up online and that can be easily accessed in villages across India. So the proof of concept for that was done in New Delhi. So I was one of the volunteers for that initiative. So what really happens is most of us would have liked to be taught a subject in a certain way. So for example, if you want to learn earthquakes, rather than they telling us about plates and tectonic plates, what they do is they show a news item of the Haiti earthquake so that we can relate to that. And then there's actually a game in which you actually predict in a room what's the first object that would actually fall down in case of an earthquake because it's a, it's a real-time simulation of what really would happen. So that's the best way students actually learn. And these are class plans, like you said, that are developed by individual students. So, what yes, sir. Name, what is his name? Sir, his name is uh, Prasad Ram. And we Sh Sure, sir. It's, it's called Guru. It's uh, endorsed by Bill Gates as well. So that's... Uh, yes. So actually, uh, we need to get even more basic than that. What you've suggested is, of course, an excellent idea. But the problem is even deeper. And uh, the reason why I know this, know a little bit about this, is because uh, my wife has been working on some of these issues. Uh, would you believe that in municipal schools in Gujarat, there are eight standard children who do not know how to measure height? Right? They do not know the concept that there is an inch tape uh, with which you can measure height, that they do not know how tall they are. Forget about doing basic arithmetic. 
and even in uh, some of the best schools in the country, uh, children do not understand what a square root is. So let us say you are a sixth or seventh standard student in the best school in the country. Most of the children do not understand what is the meaning of square root until it is much, uh, until much later than they need to. These are real issues. So what can be done? Uh, it turns out that there's a shift that needs to happen. Whenever you're teaching a concept, right, there's a shift that happens. You're seeing the concept in a particular way, which is a barrier, and then the shift happens to a different level. And sometimes it's a picture, it's a metaphor, but that metaphor can be expressed very, very clearly, very, very simply. So one way to think about this is to possibly develop just a one-page lesson plan, right? An hour of teaching, and you want to teach division. You want to teach multiplication by negative numbers, right? It's a pretty complex issue. Think about how you teach a child what multiplying by minus two means. It's not immediately obvious. But there's a central theme or a picture which you can uh, communicate in just one page and put a lesson plan around it. And she has certainly put, uh, you know, in, in terms of working with municipal children for several years now, she's put together several of these one-page lesson plans. We are happy to make them available if you think that they might be templates for other kinds of explorations. That is, uh, that, so that, that is one way to take it forward and many others, I'm sure. So I would say that in the next 10 minutes that we have, in two minutes for winding up with an end, 5-15 get time to finish, right? So can we now, everything that has been presented has been presented? Uh, they, have they have uh, told like they want to build a moral fabric of India and to promote national unity. So they have not mentioned what kind of uh, policies they are going to bring for that and what kind of steps they are going to take. One suggestion would be that they can uh, they can arrange for students to go to different places, see the whole country. That is the best way to promote national unity. Then they will get connected and see what the people they are. are and so that is the best way. There are some policies like Bihar government has initiated a policy called uh, Mukhyamantri Pari Brahman Yojana. So uh, in that uh, the young children are provided with some money. Or if it is not possible, then uh, we can also make documentaries. And those documentaries can be circulated. So persons can. Means, uh, young children can see it and feel connected. So that is one. Yes. Uh, the one thing that we uh, left out was uh, you told of youth development agencies. So I think we have been touching upon that point of NSS and and, and NSYK, but still uh, the bill is very vague about youth development agencies, and it says the government will support youth development agencies, and. As we all know, uh, not all youth development agencies are uh, non-partisan and secular. There are, there are vested interests also. Some have political interests, some with religious interests. So this bill doesn't give any uh, proper code or guideline to which uh, youth development agencies one, the government will support and will uh, see it as a role for youth development. So I think this is one thing that we need to suggest properly because uh, I can we can we can very well see you know tomorrow youth congress might be getting a, a, a financial support from the government in the uh, in the garb of this. You are right. You are right. Those fears cannot be just mentioned. Either which other party, doesn't matter. Yeah, it can be all parties use it. Sir, this uh, promotion of national values is again a very very debatable question. Nothing significant has been mentioned like how they what are the national youth values from a national value. I don't know, it's very difficult. Yeah, I think it's a small cartoon, separating a cartoon that you can change. And that can also be a national value. All kinds of values come yes. Any other thought that you feel, even if the policy document does not include, should be included, and can bring some freshness to the debate in the country, because I'm sure when you send the feedback, it will be put up on the website of IMA, your, your group must be having a web page, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Ah, so you will put up on the web this document that you sent for public debate in a bloggable manner so that people can comment on it. And I can of course share it on my Facebook when you send it to me. Uh, but we should also try to add some provocative, even if apparently impossible, ideas. 
what uh, was mentioned just now about the lesson, I think you should have one section on what is expected of youth. It could be in education, it could be in health. I mean, imagine for a minute, and I know you will all be raising your eyebrows. If doctors have to spend a year before they are allowed to become doctor in the service, why wouldn't managers be asked to spend at least six months or three months, depending upon the tenure of their education, uh, before they are licensed to serve the company they are managing? Why not? Three months of service for small enterprises. Go and improve the country. Turn around an enterprise, improve inventory system, improve supply chain, do something for one enterprise for three months. Only then you are qualified to be called as manager. Uh, uh, Would you like to propose that? Uh, not to <laughs> <laughs> you know what? You know what? You know what? You will not propose that, but you will like the country and everybody else to do everything as that is required. Why don't you propose this? Of course, incentivize. I mean, when doctors get some stipend during that period, you should also be attentive to stipend. I'm not denying that. But I'm saying, why should only doctors be something in society? What crime have they committed? That they should be like more patriot. They will not get license to practice medicine without that one year. But you will get license to practice manage, man, become manager without that practice. You see the point? So think about it. Everybody, whether it's an engineer, architect, manager, anybody, everybody should be required to serve three months at least. Huh? Why not make it an academic requirement? Yes, sir. Correct. Why so say that. Put Why don't you make it an academic requirement? Get, get me vote. Get me everybody's vote. <laughs> this group? Uh, I mean, <laughs> all right, done. Very good. Wonderful. So you are going to put this now. And I will get it done. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Please, you have to insist to and everywhere else. Our students have agreed. Let us push for this policy. Every professional, every professional has to spend with incentive, I agree with you, three months at least, if not more, we'll bring with three months. Uh, or in service of the relevant sectoral institution in the small sector or backward region or the private area. Some social, sector also. Some social sectors where you need to serve that sector and improve managerial efficiency. If you are manager, if you are architect, improve the design of the building and you know, inner interior design and whatever have you. Functionally, you should make a school better looking, uh, hospital, private health center better looking, whatever, whichever field it is, which, whichever profession. Yes. Start, starting with the summer break, right? I think that would be one way to do it. No, someone, they have their system. I will not disturb that. I'm saying when they graduate, then they have a right to practice. They're qualified to practice, but they don't have a right to practice. No, I agree. They'll get right to practice after three years. Correct? So your convocation will be delayed by three months. <laughs> <laughs> Is that all right? Yes. What do you think? What's your name? The year, yeah. Huh? Srishti. Srishti. <laughs> Why wouldn't you be Srishti? Of course you will be Srishti. Srishti is Srishti. Very good. Uh, any other suggestions? Oh. You want to say something? Yeah. So I already seen the same thing that why don't you make it a, like a couple of uh, managing schools have done that. Uh, not I am but there are managing colleges who have made, made, made this a uh, academic requirement. For example, SP Jain School of Management, they have something like this. After the two years? Not after the two and years. And that's what I'm saying, please. My point is, after you no, finish your two years, add another three months to your required practical or experiential learning calm service. So I would not call it just learning, you're also helping somebody else learn. Which, is, which will help them learn. So what they do is, other than their internship, which everybody all the B-school students take up, they also have three months of compulsory uh, rural kind of... Strength. Yeah, also has, many institutions have, but that, I'm not even asking for that. I'm saying two-year program you do as you wish. I mean, I would not like to comment on that, that though there is a scope of the government, or you do as you wish. After fulfilling a two-year requirement, or four-year requirement in FPM, or whatever it be, spend appropriate period of time in a tactical situation, in the relevant sector, to your profession as a requirement to become entitled to practice your profession. So for example, our session gets over by March. So we effectively do 21 months of course, not 24 months. Correct. So the next three months can be utilized. Perfect, perfect, perfect. perfect. Good, 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 good. Very good argument. Very good argument. So you actually are doing two years program. Then it's a two year program, which is what it should be anyway. Good, 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 good. I'm happy. You know, this will make news tomorrow. If you just put it up, <laughs> and make sure they have news tomorrow. <laughs> Excellent point.
as an outsider but when it comes to the youth that we are talking about i'm pretty yeah. much an insider as you right, can see right, right. um my only point was uh, coming back to your point of freshness in the debates and uh, what does the youth present as their responsibilities and i think that's what we are actually lacking when we are presenting our points and that's why we lack support too cuz sometimes the elders say yeah fine you, you want this we'll get it to you but what will you do with it so if we present our arguments in a way where we're saying that okay this is what we are going to do give us this then we have a better chance you're right i mean if you are going to make lessons and you need a multimedia lab here for creating those lessons that lab will have to be here that's simple Lab will be created. I can promise you that. That's not. We don't need anybody else's support. We can do that from institution also. If the students want a multimedia lab to create content experimentally of the kind that you're talking about, and let say the first 500 contributions will come from this campus in open source in different languages of the country in an interesting manner. Why not? Why not? Why not? And it could be not merely multimedia. Doesn't mean that you cannot have a poster and a small cassette projector that will be fine with it. Can that be also much easier? So, sure. Yes. Sir, uh, 
maybe the point may be not be relevant to this context. Why instead of repeatedly creating new infrastructure, why not use what we already have? Like, so we have a good telecom infrastructure which, which has been created, <coughs> and we have this health issues. We can go for telemedicine. There are innovative solutions that can come up. So, yeah, yeah. So, these kind, so these kind of solutions, like we already have certain infrastructure, so we use it, uh, put in new in innovations, and <coughs> we can go for it. And not every time we have to create a new policy because already our constitution is very heavy. It's the largest in the world. Do not make it heavy. Implement. Go for it. Just do it. Good. That very good. Of. Very good. I think this is a good summary. Uh, we don't need to have a formal uh, conclusion. Do you, where is our friend? Do you want to say something before I conclude? <coughs> yeah, I just ask for uh, suggestions. This is the first of its kind. I mean, this is the first time we are sending a review for policy. So I will request you to send, a, send your comments or uh, how we can improve on uh, conducting such a, such a meeting. That's, that's what we expect from that's the most And important. one could take up different policies for infrastructure, for banking, for, you know. Uh, yeah. We are planning for many policies uh, in the future also, so we need your inputs for improving this process. And also we'll uh, put the transcript in our social media site or in our web page. And we invite uh, your comments and suggestions there also. I mean, comments and suggestions related to the bill that we need to include it in the feedback. Well, while closing the discussion for the day, I would just say that what Fishti has said and what uh, Himan has said, if we can uh, get commitment from the entire batch of yours and of the PHP2s to that, and we can get a common day signed by everybody, address to the director saying that we want this to be implemented from this year onwards from March 2013, I tell you, you would have brought about a small revolution in this country. Because you would have done something that really needs to be done. You will do it voluntarily. We have to find funds for your three months sustenance, which I don't think will be difficult. Once you put down this note in your thing that we want to contribute for making our small enterprises or social enterprises more viable, more efficient, more functional. It could even be a district administration. It could be a school, whatever. I mean, any, any sector of Indian society, Indian economy, which needs its support. And on on priority, you can take up more difficult regions, difficult sectors. The support will not be wanting in this area. But if you do that, tell me today, then it becomes news tomorrow. But I need I need support. I, it should come out as a voice of the students, by the students. If you need some more time, take more time. But I can tell you, most good decisions don't require more time. They require less time. The moment you give more time, the decisions quality goes down. So whatever you have to do, do it today. Thank you so much. All the best. Good luck.